Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. This is Living Better Longer. Uh, <laughs> Healthy Compounds Found in a Mediterranean Diet, a webinar free featuring Dr. Francesco Vizioli. My name is Alexander Michaels. I am the Communications Officer for the Linus Pauling Institute, and I'd like, you to, I'd like to welcome you to the first webinar of of 2024. This is the first one of our webinar series. If you have never been to one of our webinars before, I suggest you check them out after today's uh, webinar is done. We've had um, webinars on vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, zinc, broccoli, healthy aging, a couple uh, uh, webinars on healthy aging, cognitive function. Um, and so there's a lot of webinars for you to go look at. But um, today, we have a webinar that feeds directly into the mission of the Lions Pauling Institute for increasing health span and longevity. Um, well, e e eating health span for all, really. It feeds directly into our stomachs uh, because we're going to be talking today about the Mediterranean diet. And we're going to be looking at some of the compounds found in the foods that make up this dietary pattern. Uh, we have you here for about an hour. We, we're going to finish today at about noon Pacific time. And um, like the others in our webinar series, uh, Dr. Vizioli will be giving a short presentation at the beginning of the webinar, and then we're going to transition to a Q&A session. Um, I will be back to talk about the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, uh, but first, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Ho uh, online and to introduce our speaker. Emily? Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Ho. I'm director of the Linus Pauling Institute, and I wanted to welcome you to our Linus Pauling Day webinar. So today, February 28th, is Linus Pauling's birthday. Here in Oregon, Linus Pauling Day, i.e. Dr. Pauling's birthday, uh, we celebrate it. And here at the Institute, we use it as an opportunity to connect with our followers worldwide. Um, for Additional information, uh, following today's webinar this afternoon, we will have an open house um, at the Linus Pauling Center uh, here at OSU campus in Corvallis, where people can hear more about our research, connect with our faculty, our students, and our staff. Um, I know many of you online today aren't um, necessarily near Corvallis, but if you are, I encourage you to come by here at 3 p.m. Pacific time for our open, for our open house. Um, now on to today's webinar. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Francesco Vizioli. Um, he is definitely not in our neighborhood today. Our esteemed speaker is joining us um, all the way from Italy. Uh, Dr. Vizioli, do you want to turn on your camera? So in terms of introductions, you know, where do I start uh, with uh, Dr. Vizioli's career? Um, he's been a full professor of pathophysiology at the Université de Paris, uh, where he directed the micronutrients and cardiovascular disease unit. He was also a senior investigator at the Madrid Institute for Advanced Studies in Food. He is now a professor of human nutrition at the University of Padua, Padua, sorry, I'm pronouncing it wrong, probably in Italy. <laughs> Um, Dr. Vizioli is an, an international leader in the study of bioactive food components and health. Uh, his current research focuses on polyphenols and essential fatty acids, and specifically the role in atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. In particular, relevant to, to today, uh, the Vizioli group has discovered the biological and pharmacological properties of phenol phenolic compounds that are found in olive oil including one you may have heard of, um, hydroxytyrosol. Um, in addition, Dr. Vizioli is studying other bioactive food components, including uh, lycopene from tomato and biophenols from wild greens. Um, aside from uh, Francesco's many achievements in the field of nutrition, he is a long-term friend of the Lyons Pauling Institute. Back near the beginnings of the Institute here in Corvallis um, in 1998, uh, Francesco won uh, the M. Daria Host Award by the International Atherosclerosis Society. Um, this allowed him to take a sabbatical here at the Institute, uh, working with our former director, Dr. Balls Fry. And he liked it so much that he came back subsequent summers to work with Dr. Tori Hagen, another one of our principal investigators. 
Uh, this last year, Dr. Vizioli was awarded the very prestigious FENS Award that was issued by the Federation of European Nutrition Societies, one of the highest awards um, in nutritional science. When he accepted the award, um, he told the audience that the LPI was, quote, the best time of his life, and we really appreciate his long-term friendship and, and collaboration. So thank you uh, for joining us today, and we're really excited to hear about your research and the powers of the Mediterranean diet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so the first minute, I think, uh, first, first I'll, I'll share my, my presentation, and, and, the, and I will spend the first minute uh, thanking Dr. Hall, Director Hall for inviting me, and, uh, and Dr. Michaels for organizing the whole thing. I have great memories, very fond memories of the LPI, of Corvallis in general. And uh, I did, I did say that, you know, they gave me this, the most prestigious European award last year. <laughs> I still don't know why. But uh, one thing I said, so they told me, you know, can you can you just uh, tell us about your, your career? And I said, uh, you know, I, I did, I worked in, in four, in four different countries. And, but yeah, the best place for research I found was indeed the LPI. I, I, I'm serious. I, I said that in front of people who didn't really care. So I'm not making this up in, uh, anyway. Okay, so let's dig into, into what uh, the Mediterranean diet is uh, or, 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 uh, or is not. So we will eventually um, start from a long time ago. Long time ago means uh, uh, the birth of agriculture. Uh, some people say 20,000 years ago, but most people agree on 10,000 years ago. It's very difficult to find remains. You cannot really find remains of food or wood uh, very difficult to to date uh, uh, archaeological remains, and we still don't know why we uh, started the agricultural uh, revolution, if you want to call it. Uh, we were hunters, gatherers before that, and then we settled down. Why? No one knows. Maybe climate change. Uh, some people said uh, that we migrated until we found a great place to settle down. So we moved from being nomads to farmers. This is called the Neolithic Revolution. If you look at the pictograms in caves, uh, you see the one above is Paleolithic uh, culture. They were hunters, they hunted. But then we started to domesticate animals. The first one likely we domesticated was the dog. And no one knows why, it's useless. Uh, Native Indians and uh, Native Americans, they, they use dogs to, to pull uh, sledges, but but otherwise, no one knows. But that, other uh, than that, we domesticated cow, sheep, somehow horses, uh, goats, uh, blah, blah, blah. And more, most important, we started to grow our own food. Most of the food we eat in the Western world uh, comes from here, uh, unfortunately now, uh, from the Middle East. Unfortunately now, the Middle East is famous for, for regions that uh, we're not proud of. Uh, but back then, uh, we settled down here uh, why? Again, no one knows. Maybe it's very fertile um, soil, uh, maybe perfect weather, who knows? But we started to grow wheat, we started to ferment wheat. <laughs> There's an interesting theory that says that we started to drink alcohol before we ate cereals. Uh, fermentation uh, occurs uh, spontaneously, and maybe we found this incredible product, which is called exactly beer or alcohol. Uh, we started to drink it. And then we also uh, planted the seeds, and then we started to eat cereals. And uh, olives come from here, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So just to shrink it, I'm, 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 I want to, I'm saying this to, to show you how recent is what we eat. So this is more or less the timeline. Four and a half billion years ago, Earth forms, and then life emerges. Only 250,000 years ago, uh, we were on, on, on the Earth, we appeared on the Earth as modern humans. Of course, we were we are much older than that. And 10,000 years ago, birth of agriculture, birthday of agriculture. So it's very difficult for us to, um, to understand how long or how much uh, for billion years is. So let's shrink everything to one year. Okay, let's pretend that four and a half billion years the Earth forms, which is just one year. Huh? We shrink it, we compress it to one year. And if we do that, 1st of January, the Earth forms. And then on the 12th of March, life emerges. Life meaning algae, meaning microbes, or bacterial life. Uh, 
And then on the 21st of December, actually half an hour before midnight, before, before, uh, before we celebrate modern humans, and only one minute, one minute before the new year, agriculture. So it's nothing, you know. What we eat is super new, it's very recent. And I'm saying this because who knows what we, the future will, will, will hold for us. You know? We will eat in the future foods that do not exist now. Super interesting from a research viewpoint. Again, what we eat is very recent. So tradition, quote unquote, doesn't really exist. What we eat in Europe, for example, tomato. Okay, let's make an example clear. An example of, of tomato. It's not European. It comes from it's come from Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been imported by the conquistadores, Spanish uh, conquistadores, and now it's super typical. You know, pizza and so forth. It's not. It is, but it's not. We need to go back what five hundred years ago, which is again nothing. Okay, when we talk about the Mediterranean diet, now I want to clear up uh, a little bit of of of, of things here. Uh, Scientifically, from a scientific viewpoint, when we say Mediterranean diet is the diet that was adopted or in use in southern Italy in the late 50s. Why? Because this guy on the left-hand side of the screen, as a keys, was sent there by the U.S. Army, and he settled down there. Uh, and then he realized that there was no uh, heart disease or very little heart disease. He was saying that in Naples, for example, when uh, the, a patient with a, with a myocardial infarction uh, went to the hospital, the whole hospital was going down to see him because it was super rare, very, very bizarre thing to see someone with, a, with heart disease or myocardial infarction. And he was from Minnesota and he thought, wow, that's super different from, from you know, the, 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 what I'm used to. But why? And he thought it was the diet. Was he right? Was he wrong? Uh, we would like to also would like to underscore something interesting. Or, or, so scientifically, again, that it's uh, the Mediterranean diet is that kind of diet which does not almost exist anymore. But there are many Mediterranean diets. It's easy, and we do it all the time to group to group them all together and talk about one Mediterranean diet. But for example, uh, the the most uh, the highest amount of green tea is not. Uh, drank in China, but in Morocco, they drink a lot of green tea. They don't drink alcohol. If you're Muslim, you don't drink alcohol, or you don't eat pork. And you do eat pork if you're Spanish, or and if, but you don't eat much lamb or goat if you're Spanish, but you eat a lot of lamb and goat if you are, for example, Algerian, and so forth. So there's plenty of differences. So this is a book we published uh, many years ago now, uh, which is plural, the Mediterranean diets. But for the sake of simplicity, we reduce it or we narrow it down to one, just one Mediterranean diet, which again, as I said, is disappearing. This is a quite recent paper that shows that the Mediterranean diet actually is more popular in Australia and India than, than in the Mediterranean area. Hmm, it's interesting, I think, I'm afraid. Uh, so what's the Mediterranean diet? Uh, it's not easy to, de to, to, to describe it or to define it. Again, there are many Mediterranean diets. Uh, me, for example, I'm from Northern Italy. I don't eat Mediterranean diet. I'm not used to the Mediterranean diet. I do, I do adopt the Mediterranean diet, but it's not popular where I'm from. Uh, Southern Italy, they do, but not, not where I'm from. Uh, next to Milan, mm, not much. But if you want to shrink it, uh, what is it? It's plenty of vegetables. It's a plant-based diet. Okay, so that's the whole goal of today. It's a plant-based diet. Plant-based means lots of vegetables, legumes, fruits, but not much. Uh, nuts, seeds, cereals. Uh, the longest living people in the world have their diet based on carbohydrates. Uh, cereals means uh, uh, pasta, couscous, bread, potatoes. Rice, which is Asian, but now they also eat it in in in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, what really sets it apart is olive oil. Olive oil is typical of Mediterranean diet. You have lots of uh, carbohydrates in Japan or, or in other parts of the world, Thailand, whatever. But uh, there's no olive oil other than in the Mediterranean uh, area. Not much saturated fat. Uh, most of it because there's not much red meat. Most of it comes from dairy products. And dairy are mostly, well, there is some milk, but people don't drink much milk. They, they eat cheese, yogurt, ferment, so fermented uh, milk, which is interesting for the microbiota. Hmm. 
Some fish, depending on how close to the coast you are, some people do not eat fish. Some people eat lots of fish. It depends on the availability. Again, not much meat. Very expensive. Meat was very expensive. Poultry, mm, super expensive. And it's also quite useless from an, an evolutionary viewpoint, meat. If you have a cow, it's uh, better to, to milk it than to kill it and eat its meat, because then it's finished. So you want to keep it alive as much as you can. So it's very expensive. Red meat is very expensive in general. It was, and it, it, it should be. Uh, uh, OK, <laughs> that's, uh, that's politics. <laughs> Alcohol, also very interesting and very controversial. And I will spend 30 seconds here. Because when we talk about alcohol, it's a very hot topic now. So some people say the, the, the safe level of alcohol you take is zero. Uh, most people agree on one or two drinks per day associated with the longevity and, uh, and the heart health. Uh, so what, what, what's, what's true? What, what is the truth? Uh, we don't know. But it's very alcohol. Uh, maybe has a different effect depending on the form of which you take alcohol. Uh, in the Mediterranean area, usually it's wine, mostly red wine, uh, with meals. That's it. People don't drink alcohol outside of, of meals. So when they don't eat, they don't drink more or less. It's also very different uh, if you drink alcohol with meals than binge drinking. So when we do, when they do, if the biological studies, they ask people, how much do you drink? Oh, OK, let's say I drink seven drinks per week. I can drink uh, one glass of wine per day, or I can drink seven beers or glasses of wine on Saturday night. So the effects on health are very different. Uh, beer, alcohol, beer, wine, uh, more or less, probably the same effect on health. Uh, but the, the, the way they, they, they drink it uh, might have a different effect on health. So this is very important. Oh, by the way, I don't know. OK, I digress here. There's no French paradox, OK? It does not exist. Uh, it's a marketing stunt. It was a marketing stunt. Uh, there's no paradox. So France has a very low uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease. Why? They have a very good healthcare care system, uh, very good and affordable health care system. And they have a gradient of mortality. So in the north, they die more or less at the same speed, at the same rate as Belgians, which are uh, on the right hand side, and in the south, they die at the same rate as Catalans, which are the neighbors on the left hand side. Uh, so it, there's no French paradox, okay? They do drink alcohol again in the form of wine with meals. Does it make a difference? Uh, maybe, maybe yes, probably yes. Okay. I don't think it's so often, not always, often uh, overlooked is the use of wild plants. Sprouts, for example, I had a European project now many, many years ago, and we went to southern Spain, southern Italy, and Crete, which is the island of, 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 of Greece, and we found very secluded areas, very secluded villages, where early in the morning, uh, the elderly, they walk out, they climb mountains, they go out in the field, and they pick they pick wild plants. Uh, we don't know what they are, more or less. I mean, ethnobotanists, yes, they do know what they are. Uh, and these people call these plants in the local dialect. Uh, uh, and then they, what do they do? They cook soups, they prepare uh, pies, uh, they eat them raw, they steam them, uh, whatever. It depends on the season. And I think this is overlooked. Uh, there's plenty of phytochemicals in wild plants, and we should uh, revamp them. We can uh, grow them again, uh, or we can grow them uh, somehow. I, I don't know how. I'm not, a, I'm not an agronomist. But we can grow them uh, one way or the other one, and I think it should be revamped. Uh, you know, the LPI is very, very, very strong on sulforaphane and, and all these compounds, uh, uh, very abundant in wild plants. The, it's disappearing, and it's a pity. It's a pity. The culture is disappearing with it, and... Uh, so the question of why people in Mediterranean area live longer and better. Is it genetics? OK, it could be, could be. There are no genes. And as of today, 2024, uh, we did not find any different genes, different genes that are different than, than other genes from other. Uh, is it they occur because they eat traditionally in a relaxed way with family, friends, so conviviality? Oh, it's big. Conviviality is super big, very hot topic now. Uh, the U.S. Surgeon General declared loneliness as, a, as an epidemic. You know? uh, has a very strong uh, effect on, cardio on the cardiovascular system, cardiovascular risk. Uh, 
relaxed or they take a nap in the afternoon? Is it, is it because the sun exposure they synthesize more vitamin D? Uh, shepherds, for example, one of the blue zones, which I think uh, I don't agree with the you know blue zone thing. But the, the centenarians in Sardinia, it's the island of uh, of uh, of Italy. It's one of the places in the world where people live the longest. What do they do? They eat sausage, cheese. Oh, well, yes, but they walk a lot, they're shepherds. So they walk, let's say, eight miles a day, uh, moving lambs, picking wild plants, chatting, sitting in the shade, and then uh, very low pollution. Is it because of that? Is it because of diet? Mm. We think it's because of diet. How do we know that? Okay, let's go back to the university university class for, for, for women. Mm. Just want to tell you this, the difference between epidemiology and clinical trials. So epidemiology is what? We walk around Oregon or the United States or Thailand or you name it, Ecuador, and we ask people what they eat. And that's already uh, complicated because no one really uh, remembers what they eat. But anyway, and then we go to the hospital and see what they die from or, or what they're sick of. And then we make correlations. Okay. So we find out that people who eat more tomatoes, they die less of prostate cancer. I don't know, making this up. Very different than clinical trials. And I will tell you a difference in a few seconds. Very careful. We need to be very careful with epidemiology. So people who do epidemiology, they know how to do it. Okay. I'm just, just not really joking, but I'm provoking some, some thoughts. This is a, a slide by Helmut Sees. Helmut Sees is the creator of the of the expression oxidative stress. So he's, he discovered or he saw that in Germany there were fewer storks. If you're a baby, which is the proof that at least the stork that brings the baby. Of course, it's but we can we can make we can make better or more complicated things. For example, this is Nicolas Cage, who's a love, great actor, but uh, it, it's better if he's uh, unemployed because these, these are uh, people who drown in, in pools. So when P Nicolas Cage doesn't work, doesn't appear in, in films, uh, people do not drown, and then he works, and people start drowning, and then they leave him at home again. And he doesn't work, and people are safe. Then the Hollywood calls Nicolas Cage and people start dying. Uh, he doesn't work anymore. People do, do not die. And then again. So again, uh, uh, my, my 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 goal. Um, yeah. So 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 my uh, what I mean to say is that correlation does not mean causation. So the fact that uh, people in the Mediterranean area eat a certain kind of diet does not mean that it's exactly that diet that is responsible for longevity and better health. How do we, so how do we, how do we uh, get out of this conundrum of this situation? So there are basically are two different things, two, two different ways, I'm sorry, two different ways. The first one is to do a lot of in vitro basic biochemical studies, which is what we do at LPI, which is what we do all over the world, okay? So you take cell cultures, you take uh, uh, test tubes, and you study enzymes responsible for cardiovascular disease, you study enzymes responsible for um, cancer, neurodegeneration, you study mechanisms. The second way is to do what we do in, pharma I'm a pharmacologist by training. So in pharmacology, what we do, we do randomized control studies, uh, clinical trials, which means that me at night, I take rosuvastatin because I have high cholesterol and I take rosuvastatin because it's been studied against a placebo. Now, we will come back to that in 30 seconds or so. So in vitro, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Latin word, more or less, that says, that says in glass. Okay, the translation is horrible. But it means uh, with no uh, human beings involved. Very important, because it clarifies, clarifies mechanisms. If something doesn't work in a cell culture, it does not likely work in humans. But it cannot prove in vivo action. This is the case of resveratrol. In you know, resveratrol, is, it does miracle in cell culture or in test tubes, and then it's not bioavailable, it's called. So you, you can take as much resveratrol as you want. You find very little, if any, in your plasma. So what we want to know is in vivo. In vivo means, should I use this food or should I take this supplement? Should I take vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, sulforaphane? Should I eat more broccoli? Should I eat pasta? Should I eat fish? I don't like fish. Should I eat it anyway? <laughs> so how do we do that? Again, it's like a placebo-controlled trial. 
on one side, we, we take, let's say, 10,000 people, 20,000 people, 50% we give them a, a, a sugar pill, which is called a placebo, 50% we give them treatment, which can be uh, rosuvastatin in my case or in other cases, or uh, hypotensive medications, or you want to test fish, you give them fish. Very complicated. What's a placebo fish? You know, you cannot really. Green tea, ah, you can use hot water, but then again, people will tell the difference in taste. And so this is the interesting case I'm making tonight. Oh, oh tonight. Okay, today. I'm nine hours away <laughs> on the other side of the world of, of, of olive oil. Mm. Because again, as I said, olive oil is what really sets the Mediterranean diet apart from other, other diets. Um, uh, carbohydrates, yeah, you can find them anywhere, more or less. Uh, proteins, and more or less. Fish, oh, you go to Scandinavia, plenty of fish, so forth, blah, blah, blah. Cheese, plenty. So olive oil is interesting, and, and it's uh, said, so it's used. Uh, it's picking up in the United States. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is thanks to the North American Olive Oil Association. They sent me these uh, these slides or, or, or this data. Uh, you guys import more and more, which is great. Production is concentrated in California. Uh, they produce a lot and they produce good quality olive oil, but also not only in California, but also in Oregon. Yeah, they're producers in Oregon. Olive oil producers in Oregon. Uh, yeah, great. Go ahead. So let's talk about olive oil, oli olive oil for uh, for a few seconds or for a few minutes, because the interesting thing about olive oil. Oh, well, first of all, how do you tell if an olive oil is of good quality or not? Oh, you taste it. And I have I have an official uh, tasting glass here. And why is it blue? Oh, it's blue because um, because it should it should be a well of color. So color does not tell much. Uh, you, we are trained to to see green colors as uh, as flavorful or no, more 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 fruity, but it's uh, but it's not the case. Not always the case. Okay, if you see something really red, it's probably rancid, and then you warm it up a little bit, and it and it creates aromas. And olive oil is a bit like wine. You know, people like to brag about wine or, or you know, can detect flavors uh, in wine, but no one talks about olive oil. This is a, a wheel of, of, of olive oil. Uh, it should uh, smell like mint or like artichoke. My favorite one uh, smells like tomato leaf. And that's a negative flavor. If it's rancid, if it's, uh, but it, it should be pungent. Uh, bitter, flavorful. It should be. It should smell really like green grass. Mm. And then you describe it. And there are some official official uh, sheets. Uh, defects, or positive or positive attributes. You give them. You give them a note, and you sell it. Uh, the more polyphenols it has, the, the the sharper, the more bitter it is. Okay. Why? Because it contains polyphenols. So you would say, well, what's the difference between polyphenols in extra virgin olive oil and polyphenols in, uh, in, uh, um, in say, cocoa or, or red wine? Big difference. Cocoa, red wine, blueberries, you name the coke, coffee, tea, you name it. More or less, they do not have the same polyphenols, but more or less. But these two, hydroxytyrosol and norepinephrine, are peculiar to olive oil, to olives and olive oil. Okay, the, in the interesting thing of olive oil is it's produced without solvents. There are no solvents. You cannot extract olive oil. You do separate it. So you take the olives, you crush them, and then you mix the paste, and then you squeeze it. Now, these days, you centrifuge it. Uh, and then you have olive oil from on one side and water from the other one. Hydroxytyrosol and olive oil are the only ones that have been found in olive canthal. They only be found in olive oil. Some people found them in wine, but it's a bit controversial. So, and the, the other thing I want you to know is that research on olive oil is way more advanced than, say, red wine, green tea, blueberries, uh, coffee, uh, whatever, you, you name it. It's the most important study. Uh, it, it's, most, uh, it's, a, it's a food item that's been studied the most. So hydroxytanosol is, is really typical of extra virgin olive oil, and it's the only, it's the only phenol only phenol with the European Food Safety Authority approved the health claim. There are no health claims for, for any red wine or, or green tea, catechins, or nothing. Uh, it's just hydroxyzone. And why? Because it's the only food that's been studied in humans. What do you mean by that? Oh, it's been studied in humans with harder points. 
So, how, so what's the difference? If you study, if you want to study again, green tea, blueberries, apples, or oranges, whatever, you give them to people, then you draw blood, you measure what are called surrogate markers. So you measure cholesterol, you measure blood pressure, you measure uh, glucose, you measure lipoproteins, uh, triglycerides, you name it, okay? But you, you cannot predict mortality. So if it lowers uh, cholesterol, is a great thing, but does it really provide longevity or, or better or better health? You don't know, no, no. Again, the only way to study or to, to say yes or no is to do a randomized clinical trial. Placebo versus treatment. Sugar pill versus rotavastatin. Uh, water versus uh, green tea uh, or whatever. Complicated. Cholesterol, no. No, uh, olive oil has very minor effects on cholesterol. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, it's, it's a law. You cannot put it on a label, but why? Uh, precisely because of that, it does not really have a major effect. So uh, stop saying that olive oil lowers blood cholesterol, which is very interesting from a research viewpoint. So uh, people who use uh, uh, primarily or extra virgin olive oil uh, do not get sick or, or live longer despite the fact that it does not uh, lower cholesterol. So why? Eh, this is this is super interesting. This is why we're working in the lab. Uh, this is the, why the FBI exists. Uh, anyway, so well, we want to prove it in vivo. Okay, so we can show enzymes, we can show whatever, anti-inflammation, but should I take, use it or not? Okay, there are two kinds of, of, of prevention. Okay, the first one is primary prevention, means that we are healthy and we do not want to get sick. The second kind is secondary prevention, means that I already had my cardiac infection, it's enough. I don't want to go to the hospital again, okay? So, so yeah. what should I do? I don't want to, I don't want to uh, get sick again. Let's focus on the cardiovascular system. There are two trials with exogenous oil. Well, okay, well, this one is the first one, it's been published in the American Journal of uh, in, uh, New England, I'm sorry, in, in the New England, it's called the Previmed. What did they do? They took uh, subjects and they gave them three different diets. One was a Mediterranean diet with more extra virgin olive oil. The second one was a Mediterranean diet with nuts, so almonds, uh, um, I, I can't remember which one, I can't remember the other ones, but uh, nuts and seeds and such. And the third one is probably the most interesting one because it's a controlled diet. So these were people at a cardiovascular risk and their doctors said, of course, do not eat fat, okay, cut fat, work, finish, oh, fat, fat. They followed them for about five years and then they stopped because people on a Mediterranean diet with nuts and people on Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil started to, do, to, to die less than people on a controlled diet, a prudent diet, a low fat diet. And if we look at mortality, a total, the first one was cardiovascular disease, but if you look at total mortality, people who lived the longest were those on Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil. So this, it's a hard end point. It's mortality. You can't you count the deaths. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But then there's also another trial, and one of these uh, cardiopragmatic investigators uh, was in the steering committee of this trial. Uh, very interesting uh, to design the trial. So people, so these are people who were already infarcted, already had an infarction. And so, of course, they go to, go to their doctor and he or she tells them, do not eat fat. Mm. And that's what they did. But they randomized them to low fat, less than 30% of calories from fat, or eat whatever you want, but make sure that all the fat, or most of the fat, the vast majority of the fat, of the fat you eat is from extra virgin olive oil. Seven years of follow-up, recurrence of myocardial infarction was 26% lower in people who had extra virgin olive oil as the primary source of fat. So, okay, do not exceed, uh, it's not a medicine and so forth, but do not be scared of eating fat if you had uh, knock on wood and myocardial infarction if your principal or main source of fat is extra virgin olive oil because you live longer. Mm. Okay, let's finish. It's very difficult to study food, okay? This is why the LPI exists and, and many other institutes uh, exist. It's super difficult because, again, it's easy to, stu to study acetaminophen. Okay, it's not easy. It's not easy. But you just pop a pill against a, a placebo. It's super complicated. Again, I'm a pharmacologist. But uh, try to study pasta or try to study beef. Uh, very difficult. And it's component. It's not pharmacology. Unfortunately, and I'm one of those responsible for this uh, 
problem, I think, I call it. Uh, now it's called nutritionism. That, is, is that we focus on a single component. It's it's great because we need to provide hard evidence that uh, some food are better than other ones. But it's not pharmacology. You know, it's not uh, if you're sick, you cannot get better by eating or not eating some kind of food. And so the other way uh, uh, within the seminar of today, or the of the goal of the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet is characterized by lots of plant food but also by the exclusive or almost exclusive use of extravagant olive oil, which is the only food that's been studied in humans, okay, with clinical control trials. There are no other foods that have been studied with hard points with the, the effects of mortality. So the effects of cardiovascular system are, are, are quite clear. If you use primarily extravagant olive oil, uh, you benefit your heart, for sure. The rest, yeah, be careful of propaganda. There, there's a lot of hype. On the Mediterranean diet in general, and on olive oil also, oh, cancer prevention. Likely, I believe it, but there are no hard data. Uh, neurodegeneration, eh, very likely, mm, but still no hard data. So slowly, slowly, we are working on it. Uh, but in the meantime, <laughs> uh, we'll, be back, we'll be back with, with some accepting data. Eat healthy. You know, that's, uh, it's very important for your health to eat a proper diet. And what's a proper diet? It's a plant-based. Do not stress, okay, this is probably my final message, do not obsess over, over diet, but uh, choose plants. Plants means carbohydrates, any source of carbohydrates in moderation, do not ex exaggerate. Uh, and so if you want to build your diet, do not, again, do not obsess, do not stress over your diet, but think of vegetables, think of veggies, and then build the rest of the, uh, around it. Oh, I like red meat once a week, yeah, so what's the problem? I like cheese, yeah, we are welcome. Finish. Mm, it's great. But everything should be designed around a plant-based dinner. Plant-based. And <laughs> if you want to dress your vegetables, there's nothing better than extra virgin olive oil. High quality. Oh, it's expensive. Money's tight. I uh, know you're telling me, you're telling me. I hear you. It's telling me. Which is also my point. Uh, spend more for food and less for other things. Sit down and write what you what, your expense, where you can cut. But invest in food, in high quality food, not only extra virgin olive oil, but find the best cheese you can find. Uh, you're, you're, you're in the Pacific Northwest, oh, great beer, it's the best one. Drink just one great Pacific Northwest beer and do not drink three of the more commercial brands. And in the meantime, of course, listen to what the API says, uh, attend, the, attend the webinars, and, and go to the to the website. Uh, the mission is great. Uh, do great research. <clears throat> For those of you who are more interested and and uh, can, and have a hard time falling asleep, you can download these two papers uh, for free. Uh, the first one is a, is a, is an international conference we had at UC Davis in 2018, and the second one is another one we had in uh, Rennes in Spain. We are going to have another one in May this year. So every few years we gather in in southern Spain in Andalusia. Uh, we just uh, um, put together everything on olive oil uh, from uh, from technology to health uh, to uh, things I don't understand. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me and thank you so much uh, LPI for inviting me. <laughs> it's, uh, I just, uh, it just, uh, it, it's just great being back, uh, even though it's virtual, uh, I ju I'm just uh, having a great time. So thank you again. Uh, and again, eat healthy and listen to what the LPI says. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Francesco. That's a wonderful presentation, as always. Um, I really want to start asking you questions about olive oil, but I need to I need to start talking about the question and answer session first. So, um, uh, if you have a question for our speaker, um, we have there's a question and answer section uh, in your Zoom window Q and A button. You can add, enter your questions there. You can't enter questions into the chat because that's disabled. And we also aren't necessarily going to be calling on people who raise their hand. So we, we really want to get your questions in the Q&A section or Q&A uh, window, I yeah, so window. Um, on the On the topic of questions, though, I, I should say that the questions that we're going to talk about today are not going to be medical qu questions, um, especially mm -hmm. specific medical conditions. Um, you know, Francesco gave an overview of where the science is right now, but obviously uh, he's, it's, it's not nearly definitive as you would like it to be. No. Um, the, um, and 
uh, we also have 1100, over 1,100 people registered for this webinar today, and a lot okay. of them submitted questions. So uh, <laughs> we were not going to be able to get to every question no, in the question and answer session. But OK, before uh, I go too much further, I have a question. So I have a, I have a, um, a shot glass I showed you before. Mm. Uh, Extra virgin olive oil from Oregon, one of the one one of okay, the Oregon pr produces. Um, you know, if I taste it, and I'm not going to because I know it's going to make me cough a little bit. Uh, is is that an indicator of you know polyphenol content? It, can I use that as a good marker of like the good stuff that's in it? It is. So first of all, go beavers. <laughs> but but second, if you want to, you just cover cover your. I have another another glass, but you just cover it and let and let the aroma. Oh yeah, I can uh, I can smell it for sure. Oh, you can smell it. <laughs> mm. And then if you take a sip, exactly, you shouldn't do it now. Uh, it, it makes you cough. This is a great indicator of a good quality of olive oil. If you don't cough, that's okay. But if you do cough. <clears throat> That's that's the best way to tell if an olive oil is uh, is of a high quality or or not. So yeah, so, yeah. It's... So you mentioned color is not a very good indicator. So it could be, you know, very dark or very clear, um, and you won't necessarily get a lot of polyphenol indicators out of that. Um, but if the taste is there and the aroma is there, then that's what you're looking for, right? Exactly. So the color, you're not supposed to look at the color. You're not supposed to. I don't know exactly why, but I, I, I talked to professional tasters and they say, no, no, don't look at the color. Then they showed me a bottle of, of, of defective olive oil and they said, this one, I'm not even going to taste it because I know it's it's it, it's uh, rancid or something. Mm. It was a bit brownish. Yeah, I understand it. But uh, but then again, OK, just for those of you who are listening. Uh, so we tasted you now with the professional tasters. In theory, they use this blue glass exactly not to have any color. Then, it, but the the real ones they just drink it from the bottle and then they go like this and they spit in the sink. It's horrible, I know. But the professional tasters just they just take a sip, then they swirl it, and they get ooh. It's you don't want to be around when they taste it. But they can detect. I saw th I saw incredible things like they can detect uh, at which height. Of, of a hill, the olive oil was produced or, or oh. grow. Unreal, unreal. It's wow. like wine. Again, it's like wine because yeah, it's, yeah. it's a fruit juice. It's a fruit juice. Yeah. Um, fruit juice. Okay. So one of the questions that we get a lot about olive oil, and one of the questions I've always had is, how should we be using it? I mean, um, mm. we talk about polyphenols. We know polyphenols are susceptible to certain um, conditions like heat and oxygen and light and time. Um, what, you know, what's, what do we use when we're trying to shop for olive oil to, to, uh, use to our advantage and how do we store it? How do we cook with it? So any kind of fat, olive oil, butter, fish, cheese, they have three enemies, as you said, light, oxygen, and heat. So we should store butter away from oxygen, light, and heat. We should store olive oil away from oxygen, light, and heat. We should store anything you, we mentioned. Uh, so when you buy a bottle of olive oil, it's just, uh, it just yes, try to store it away in a cool place, if you have one, uh, away from light, heat, and, and then cap it every time you use it. Any kind of fat, it's better to, it's best to be eaten or used raw, but you need to cook with it. You need to cook with butter, you need to cook with cream, you need to cook with any kind of oil, seed oil, olive oil. The interesting thing about olive oil in, in the kitchen is that because of its polyphenols, it's more resistant to heat. Ah. So they're antioxidants, and so we published though 30 years ago. Uh, we tried experimentally to cook with olive oil, to heat it, and to fry with olive oil, and it's more... The, the, the only problem, if you want to fry or cook with olive oil, is precisely the taste, because it adds taste to the, to the food. Sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't. But it's the most heat-resistant uh, oil you can find in the market. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And do the polyphenols resist that heat as well? Do they stay stable? They are quite stable, and indeed, they protect vitamin E from oxidation. Oh. So basically, basically, let's say, let's say, okay, for those of you who are not chemists, <laughs> uh, let's say you have you have a certain amount of polyphenols and vitamin E in in your oil, any kind of oil, but uh, and you heat it, and of course, it starts to degrade, and so polyphenols go down, and vitamin E stays stable, and then it starts to to go down. 
but the first one is to go uh, polyphenols. Okay, um, so you know we we've got a lot of questions, and you saw some of them about like very specific components about of the mm. of the Mediterranean diet, like. Um, how much alcohol? What do I do if I I can't drink alcohol? Um, mm -hmm. you kind of you kind of you know address some of that in um, and you know uh, red meat in moderation and, and but mm -hmm. you recognize that red meat is part of Mediterranean diets. It's just not a huge part of the diet. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. It's not a huge part of the diet. But again, now red meat was uh, the most staple food, and now it's like the devil. It's neither one, okay? If you like red meat, it provides very high quality protein, uh, quite affordable. In some countries, it's a great way to promote growth, for example, of, of kids. Uh, now we, we, are eating, we went overboard, okay? We are eating too much red meat, uh, which is horrible for the environment, horrible for environment and the whole world is eating more red meat so we should slow down uh western countries should should slow down but again don't be scared okay so if you eat red meat once a week twice a week hey, that's okay what's the problem and uh, not overdo it okay not overdo it and think of the environment think of the environment and uh, how is it sourced for example then again find the most expensive red meat you can find in the market so you eat less because you don't have money to, to buy more. If, and uh, and then you, you you help the environment. And it's usually higher quality than the cheapest one. And then a lot of questions then come, you know, about Mediterranean, the vegetables in a Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, some of those vegetables aren't even native to mm -hmm. the Mediterranean region. So honestly, you can build, if I'm getting gathering this correctly, you can build a a Mediterranean style diet anywhere in the world, uh, just by using what you have at hand. Yeah, good point. Some people ask me, how, how do I do that in the United States? It depends on probably where you live, but if you're in Oregon, you go to a farmer's market. What's the issue? What's the problem? You, you have the community, you have the, you have the environment, you eat fresh produce, uh, and that's it finished. That's all. If you are in downtown Houston, it might be an issue. But if you are in uh, and, and, and somewhere else, you go to local farmer markets uh, or, or to local producers, you help the economy, the local economy. And also, again, your diet uh, will be centered around those produce, those products. So if you think, you know, oh, I gotta buy, I gotta buy vegetables. Where from? Oh, local market. That's it. Finished. You cannot eat too much, so the rest of your diet will will be um, a dressing of, of, of those of those vegetables. And of course, as quite a few of us do in Oregon, grow them in your backyard. Um, <laughs> but exactly, uh, precisely. And, and so herbs fall into that as well. Maybe maybe that's somewhat related to your your wild plant um, data. You know, just mm. kind of how um, other herbs and other botanicals might fit into the picture. That's a super interesting question because, because uh, herbs are substitutes for salt, usually, many times. So if you use lots of oregano, lots of uh, sage, lots of, you mentioned them, uh, use less salt because it's already tasted. Mm. By using less salt, uh, you know, it's good for your health, hypertension and so forth. So yeah, I, I'm not a cook, okay? But traditionally, people sprinkle uh, all kinds of herbs, and they know how to how to mix them uh, to to get the perfect taste, a tasty, a tasty, a tasty dish with very little salt. So, um, one of our uh, listeners uh, put forth a question about canola oil. Um, so, mm. if, if we're thinking about omega three fatty acids and omega six mm. fatty acids, canola looks like a more beneficial product if we're looking from the point of view of fatty acids why is why why don't we have the data for canola that we do for olive oil and yeah if, good point if the, if the ratio isn't as favorable olive oil seems like it would be worse for you but it's not it's not precisely because of polyphenols so canola is a great one because it contains omega-3 short chain omega-3 Oh, by the way, we do not know much about those short chain omega-3, which is called, mm. technically it's called alpha-linolenic acid. So 18 carbons, alpha-linolenic. And it's been studied, people are studying it, mm. I've studied it, and uh, the jury's still out. Uh, we know a lot about the long chain 
omega-3. But people sometimes confuse them. But canola has a very good fatty acid profile, but no, no, no interesting polyphenols. No. And it's never been studied in humans. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I I'm, I'm still seeing more questions about olive oil, so I'm going to get asking a few. Um, so, uh, I mean, where where I look on the grocery store shelf, you know, and I'm trying to pick out a quality mm -hmm. olive oil. How do I do it? I mean, it's really confusing. I mean, people say don't buy in uh, plastic, only buy in glass. Mm -hmm. um, look at, you know, certain uh, pieces of the label that will tell you certain terms that are being used. But then once one person uses it, one, one company uses it, more companies figure out a way to use it. So it's really hard to, to suss that out. So do you have any uh, tips for people in shopping in the supermarket? <laughs> yeah, I have a few tips. I have a few tips. Uh, avoid plastic because it's, uh, it's permeable to, to, to smells, to odors. So avoid plastic. And it's also not light. Uh, it, 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 it's not uh, she does not shield uh, from UV light. Ah. So buy olive oil in dark glass. Uh, if it's cheap, if it's inexpensive, it's not of high quality. If it is expensive, it might be of, of high quality. So what's the the only way to the best way to uh, unfortunately just buy it, taste it, and see whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, if it's tasteless, or okay, you throw away, you throw away some money. Uh, and next time you buy other ones. Then there is the North American Olive Oil Association in the US. Uh, and then there's some great uh, importers or producers. I'm not sure I should mention them, but I'm thinking of David Newman. But anyway, so there's some very knowledgeable people and you can you can look for them. In California, there are some supermarkets with, uh, with great uh, olive oil shelves uh, and you can ask uh, clerks to, to, to show them. And it's it's a, again it's a bit like wine. How do I tell if if I'm, I'm new to wine? I go to a supermarket because I have dinner tonight, and I pick a bottle of wine. How do I know if it's inexpensive? It's not good wine. If it's super expensive, it could be a good one. And then hey, bad luck. You know, you, you buy a bottle of Pinot Noir, you go back home. Eh, that's okay. <laughs> Twenty five dollars for all right. Never buy it again, uh, and so forth. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And I mean. I went to an olive oil tasting here in Oregon, and I, I got to experience the blue the blue cups, which I really enjoyed. But um, one one thing I realized is that some of the the olive oils that they had available are really strong and pungent, and and mm -hmm. uh, and really have a kick. And sometimes you or spicy, you know, uh, sp tasting, and just all the characteristics on that wheel you showed. And um, is it is it just you you drink an olive oil that that you can handle <laughs> as much uh, because some of them I, were, were overwhelming. So, um, you know, is it just whatever you feel like you can, you can handle in terms of the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the taste? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, it's an acquired taste. Yeah. And second, if you, if you go and buy olive oil, freshly squeezed, freshly produced, sometimes it's really inedible. You see, it's really inedible. It's so strong. But that's also an advantage. I mean, if it's too strong, it's too strong. Finish. But that's all, and then you just need to leave it there. After a month, it's it's ready. It's ready it, because polyphenols start to degrade, so it's ready to use. But that's also an advantage because you use less. So sometimes, sometimes people say, "No, it's super expensive." I know, I know, I know. I hear you. <laughs> Money's tight. I know. We all know that. But you use less. Uh, and that means fewer calories. So instead of using salad dressings, for example, you use a few drops or a tablespoon, not a few drops, but a tablespoon of very strong extra virgin olive oil. You get a great taste, fewer calories because you use less fat, and uh, you get a very important polyphenols that once again have been studied in humans. I, I um, We're going to have to wrap up pretty quickly, so I'm going to ask one more question. <laughs> Um, we're, we're getting close to noon and I, there's more and more questions pouring <laughs> in, so it's really hard, but, um, do you have any information comparing, um, different, or is there, is there studies on different types of Mediterranean diets? Like, for example, if someone's eating a vegetarian based mm -hmm. Mediterranean diet versus an omnivore based Mediterranean diet or, or more of one food component, like dairy, mm -hmm. non-dairy, you know, those kind of things, or, or is it, mm -hmm. is, is it really kind of hard to mm. just to cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, it's very difficult to discriminate them, to discriminate different diets. And so, no, uh, again, what, what puts them all together from Maghreb, Northern Africa to, 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 um, to Southern Spain, to Greece, to Southern Italy, it's really the use of vegetables, first of all, lots of vegetables, legumes, not much animal protein, not much animal fat. Actually, virgin olive oil is the principal source of fat. A little bit of alcohol, not in Northern Africa, but in the rest of, of the Mediterranean, yes. Uh, cheese, not much milk, but cheese, yogurt, fermented uh, dairy, which uh, might be good for your microbiota. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're all different, but they all come together with this uh, with this picture, I would say. So, okay. And well, if there are many more, I know there are more questions, so I would like to take this opportunity to ask, uh, to, to tell our listeners, to ask the API to organize another one. <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll we'll get you some questions, Francesca. Okay. You get <laughs> we we can send you I'll a feedback, back. and we'll put I'll them in our, our uh, next digital digest uh, um, coming up soon. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, thank you, Francesco, for for spending your evening with us uh, here in, <laughs> uh, for Linus Pauling Day, and um, yeah, uh, it was a wonderful talk. It was great seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. Uh, thanks the LPI for, for inviting me again. It's, uh, it's more than a honor. It's been a great pleasure. I hope you will uh, invite me again. Uh, so we will be able to, to answer more questions on, on, on any kind of topic uh, you might like. Thanks so much. And thank you for listening to me, those of you who are connected. Thank you so much for listening to me and asking so many questions. Uh, I'm, and, and at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Emily for some, some closing remarks. Yes, um, thank you again, Francesco. No, we definitely will need to uh, to bring you back. Maybe next time we'll actually bring you to Oregon um, so you can enjoy some of Oregon as well. I know it's close to lunchtime here uh, and I'm definitely rethinking my my lunch choices uh, for, for my lunch today. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. Um, I really appreciate the time you, you take to listen to our webinars and our content at, um, at the LPI. Um, before I close out, though, I also want to mention um, to hold your calendars. Our next webinar will be in April, um, specifically on a day called Damn Proud Day. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Oregon State, um, the beaver is our mascot, um, and Damn Proud Day is our annual day of, of giving. It's a time of year where some of our dedicated and generous followers have pledged to give a larger gift if certain goals are reached during the day, and this is where we need your help. Um, Gifts of any size to the Institute that day will count towards those goals, and we need many, many people to help reach our goals and unlock these generous challenges. Um, this year, we'll be raising donations specifically for our Healthy Aging Research Program and also support for our Micronutrient Information Center, which is an amazing resource. Um, check it out if you haven't um, seen it before. All these programs um, and programs like these webinar series are primarily funded by the generosity of, of people like you. So if you appreciate these programs, please consider giving uh, on Damn Proud Day. It's really a great day where your gifts will really multiply um, in terms of additional uh, monies that can come to the Institute. So for now, uh, mark your calendars for April 24th. Um, that's 42424. Uh, and I hope you can come out um, and support the Institute and look forward to another uh, webinar as well. Um, so as always, you can go to our website uh, for more information about webinars, Damn Proud Day, um, our newsletters, both our digital um, and our uh, mail versions, um, and our digital digest, which should be coming out in the next few weeks as, as well. So bottom line, uh, thank you for spending uh, the last hour with us. Uh, hope you all stay healthy and well, and happy Linus Pauling Day. Happy Linus Pauling Day, everybody. See you in April. See you soon. <laughs>